Okay, everybody, in this Module 2 lecture, I'm going to build on the discussion of the legislative process, the basic overview of the legislative process given in the previous lecture, to um, do our first consideration of what agents and actors and factors uh, are an influence on the way the legislative process goes down, the kinds of bills that make it through, the, how the bills are shaped, what the ultimate policy outcomes are. In the subsequent lecture, we're going to look at a different set of uh, influences, and I've divided these roughly up into internal and external influences. The internal influences are the individuals and groups uh, that uh, within Congress that, uh, that have influence, and in the next lecture we're going to look at outside groups, money, lobbyists, to, to uh, see what kind of role they have. Um, obviously, the two separating the two is you know it's 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 an artificial distinction because clearly there's an interplay between them, and I'll mention some connections uh, today, but but I'm going to probably mention a lot more connections in the uh, the next lecture on uh, the influence of outside groups, money, and lobbyists, because then we'll, we'll you'll know what kind of power and roles the various individuals and groups within uh, Congress have. So today I'm going to look at caucuses, committees, and party leadership. Um, and uh, the, I, the term caucus is, it, it's a word that gets actually used in a number of different contexts. Uh, there are nominating caucuses, which are used during presidential nominating and uh, other nominating contests. Um, there, there are caucus groups within Congress, and then parties themselves are often referred to as the caucus. One of the leadership roles is the caucus chair, and this is the person who's the chair of the overall caucus. Um, party and caucus are in, within Congress, are weirdly enough equivalent terms. So let me just, I'll, I'll expand on this when I go through the list uh, um, of caucus groups. But generally, a caucus, whether it's the pr a nominating process or a group of people within some kind of body, is a group that comes together to decide what their choice is going to be in some given decision, whether it's a, a candidate for office or a bill or uh, some kind of procedure, they come together to decide internally so that then when they go out to the uh, official decision-making uh, um, system, they can present a unified block of votes. So for example, to become the Speaker of the House of the House of Representatives, you need the most votes of members of the House of Representatives. You need 218 people to say your name for Speaker of the House. Now, if you're in the majority party, if there are 225 Democrats, the Democratic caucus, that is the party, will get together and internally say, okay, who do we want to be uh, speaker? And they might have a competitive election. There might be, of the 225 uh, Democrats, there might be 130 for one candidate and 95 for another candidate. If there weren't this internal caucus uh, meeting that decided, okay, the, the person with 125 votes all 225 of us are going to, or all 220 of us are going to vote for them when it comes time to casting our actual ballot. If you don't do that, then a majority could actually split its voting power and the minority could decide who gets to be the Speaker of the House. That's, you don't want to do that. That's foolish. So part of the reason why caucus groups exist is to maximize the use of that group's collective power. A party is a caucus, a, a party within uh, a House of Congress is a caucus because the 50 Democratic senators and the 50 Republican senators, they get together and to the extent that it's possible that they can agree internally that whatever their internal disagreements are, they will present a unified uh, um, force outside, then they're going to be much more successful at getting done what they want to do. So caucusing prevents a group from dividing its collective voting power, whatever, uh, whatever the voting system might be, whether it's, a, whether it's uh, party nominations, whether it's uh, um, passing bills, whether it's choosing office holders, um, a caucus group comes together to, uh, to argue and decide. And that's actually what distinguishes a nominating caucus from a primary. A primary is like a regular election. You go to a voting booth, you fill out a circle, or you punch a screen, and you cast your vote. A caucus is where you come together with other people from your party and you argue and disagree and try to convince each other, and at the end of it, the group presents its, its, its result. Parties are the most important caucus groups in Congress. And it's because they are the biggest ones with the largest blocks of voters. 
And to the extent that if you're a party that can uh, gain a majority of seats in especially both houses of Congress, and you can reunify your caucus around uh, bills, you can succeed. The uh, power of caucusing, however, means that there are other caucus groups that form naturally because members of Congress are not just members of a party. They are individual persons with their own agenda, their own ambition, their own conscience, their own constituency, their own funders, uh, their own ideas about the direction the country should go and the way we should solve the problems that we face. And so, as an individual, you know that your power, even in the Senate with 100 votes, uh, you, unless you're that one key vote, which does sometimes happen, and, and people who, who are in that position are very, very lucky, um, it doesn't usually last very long, but one vote means nothing. Collectively, you have to come together. So if you are part of a party, which you, you almost automatically are, there are the occasional independents in, in Congress, they tend to, we hear the term, they caucus with the Democrats or the Republicans. Bernie Sanders is not a Democrat, he caucuses with the Democrats. Um, so he, he, he won't uh, attach the label Democrat to himself, but he will go to those internal meetings. Um, any group of people who might see things similarly have an incentive to caucus together. Now, the three other types of caucus groups that exist in Congress are ideological groups, that is, groups of people who see not just that they have a similar party membership, but that they see the world from a very similar perspective. Um, one of the most influential and well-known uh, ideological caucus groups in recent times has been the Freedom Caucus, which is a group of Republican members of the House of Representatives. Actually, there's one in the, in the Senate as well, but the, the more prominent, uh, well-known and influential one was in the House of Representatives. The Freedom Caucus was about 40 to 50 members of the House of Representatives who not only were Republicans, they had a very strong form of small government, anti-regulation, anti-taxation uh, conservatism. So they were very close to pure libertarians in certain ways, though uh, not entirely, but their ideological bent, con conservative bent, was stronger and more pure and more specifically targeted at uh, shrinking the size of the government than, this, than other Republicans, than I, I was about to say standard Republicans, but really more establishment conventional uh, Republicans. Um, they formed a caucus group, the Freedom Caucus. They elected a caucus chair. Uh, they had meetings. They voted internally. They largely were able to remain unified, so they presented a unified voting block. Now, the interesting thing about the Freedom Caucus is that because it was such a, a decent-sized block and because it was big enough that the Republican Caucus couldn't command a majority of votes for a bill without all of the members of the Freedom Caucus, or at least the vast majority of them, voting with the Republican Party. You're like, well, but they're Republicans. Why wouldn't they vote with the Republican Party? Because not all Republicans see things eye to eye, not all Democrats see things eye to eye. Um, the Progressive Caucus in uh, the House of Representatives is the Democratic sort of answer to the Freedom Caucus. It's the farthest left uh, version. There are, uh, there are ideological caucus groups that are actually moderate. Um, there was a group called the Tuesday Group, which was this sort of moderate group that was largely moderate Republicans, but included from time to time moderate Democrats. Um, who actually ideologically have a lot in common, more in common with each other sometimes than they have with other members of their party caucus. So these things, these kinds of things definitely happen. Um, and the, when, you get, when the groups get big enough, they can be influential. The Freedom Caucus essentially was able to make enough uh, trouble for and torpedo the Republican agenda while John Boehner was the Speaker of House. One of the reasons why he, he uh, resigned that position is because he just couldn't wrangle his overall party caucus because there was a big, unified, uh, um, very demanding, very inflexible ideological caucus within the broader party caucus. Um, the Freedom Caucus got a lot of what it wanted. And what it wanted was to stop compromise. They didn't get uh, bills passed that they wanted because that's actually one of the things that often ideological caucuses, they can make trouble and they can maybe get amendments added or they can stop things but they have a very difficult time furthering an agenda because in order to further an agenda, you really need a majority of votes. And that's why the party is still the most important caucus because if you have an agenda that you want to enact, you need a lot of people uh, in it. Um, identity caucuses are groups of people who share a, a, an identity perspective. So like the Black Caucus in Congress is one of the oldest uh, ones 
If you're an African-American member of Congress, you don't have to join the Black Caucus, but many of them do, because uh, the black members of Congress have, even Republicans and Democrats, have some affinities. The, the Women's Caucus, they have some affinities. Identity caucuses tend to be less unified than ideological ones, for what I hope are pretty obvious reasons, that identity doesn't automatically confer a similar view on policy or issues or procedures. It becomes more difficult for an identity caucus to come together and agree on how all of them are going to vote. Because if you're, if you're on the losing side, you're, you're, you're not bound to vote the way that everybody, it's not, it's not like a blood oath that says, okay, if it, whatever we, the Black Caucus, decide uh, the Black Caucus is for, all of the Black Caucus members are going to have to vote for that or someone's coming for you. Um, it's not like that. Ideological caucuses don't have a blood oath either, but they're more automatically uniform because the reason why you're a member of that caucus is because you see policy and issues and procedure pretty similarly to other people. Um, so identity caucuses exist, and that what they are actually is it, 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 they have not such a tremendous influence on power brokering within Congress, but they uh, really generate conversations and create a sense of like shared perspective, shared problems. It's really a, a good way to build relationships, and, and relationships in Congress are really important because you're among people who actually, while you might not see politics eye to eye because you have different ideologies, um, you are similarly situated in the, in the world. You're, anyone who's a, a non-white male, uh, they, there's, there are certain affinities that, that uh, people can learn from and draw. Plus, there are, there's the possibility of forming kind of blocks within these identity caucus that will vote together. Um, issue caucuses are groups of people who have a, I, I, I was about to call it a pet issue and now I'm gonna just go ahead and call it a pet issue. Um, one of the, I, I think kind of frivolous, but it's actually not totally frivolous caucuses in Congress is the Bike Caucus, which is actually uh, led by, or not, I don't think he's the chair, but one of the uh, um, spiritual leaders is our congressperson, Earl Blumenauer, um, who, you know, with, of the bike pins and of bike lanes. Uh, the Bike Caucus is a group of members of the, of the House of Representatives that want to push more bicycle use and more bicycle friendly policies. Um, there are all kinds of issue uh, caucuses, and they tend to come and go. Ideological caucuses come and go as well, but they come and go more slowly because ideologies don't shift as quickly. Issue caucuses can coalesce around issues that uh, um, might not have been an issue five years ago. Um, issue caucuses, again, like identity caucuses, doesn't mean that the people within this group all agree on policy. But many of them will, right? I mean, if you belong to the bike caucus, it's not just because you like bikes. It's because you are, uh, there are certain sets of uh, bike friendly and transportation policy in general that you want to push for and you want to get uh, enacted into law. And so coming together to even just recognize like, oh, wow, there are 150 of us in the bike caucus. We actually, and you know, even if say, I, and I think that the bike caucus does have a predominantly democratic membership, but it's like, okay, we're mostly Democrats. So we all do belong in this particular party caucus, but we're actually Democrats who have something really in common, an issue that we care about and policies that we want to push for. And that gives us some greater amount of power in the Democratic Party caucus than just being 150 separate members who all care about uh, um, a particular type of transportation policy. All of these caucus groups form for the natural reason that collective power is greater than individual power and uh, creating some kind of unified approach to the legislative process uh, will leverage whatever numerical power you have into actual political power. That's why they form. And most of them have an official structure. They have a leader, they have a chair or co-chairs and a chair and a vice chair. Sometimes they have a whip. Uh, they duplicate the um, party leadership structure. Uh, some of them have, most of them have regular meetings, like they'll have breakfast together every Tuesday morning. That's why the Tuesday group is called the Tuesday group, because they had breakfast together every Tuesday morning. Um, so the, the idea of, of a committee structure, a chairperson, f uh, I I informal meetings, and then formal meetings are all part of the way caucuses go about trying to leverage that whatever they have in common, right? Each of these groups of people has something in common um, that gives them the possibility of having unity. The biggest factor that contributes to caucus success is unity. And I should put this up here, right? Unity is key. One of the things about party caucuses is that 
it's the most difficult caucus group to to uh, generate and sustain unity for because it's the most diverse. It is also the largest, so it's the most effective, right? So if you have 220 Democratic members of the House of Representatives, you have enough uh, members of your party caucus that if you all vote together, you can pass any bill that you want. Obviously, that's really that's better than the Bike Caucus or the um, Tuesday group, which which has short of the majority necessary. Any caucus that's smaller than the, than the majority party is going to need to form coalitions. And that adds a whole new wrinkle to things, and it's very difficult to form coalitions among opposing or, or distinct caucus groups. The party caucus obviously is the most uh, potential, has the most potential for power, but because it's the largest and because th there are all kinds of Democrats and all kinds of Republicans, uh, Democrats who, who come from swing states or swing, swing states or swing districts, who come from safe states or safe districts, who come from suburban or, or urban or rural, that it's the party caucus itself is more diverse and harder to unify. Um, in the past, it was easier for party leaders to unify the party caucus around a particular set of policy, and there are a lot of reasons for that. Partly that the ideological caucuses really didn't have as, there, 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 there wasn't as much power, there wasn't as much organization. One impact of Citizens United is that ideological caucus groups actually sprouted up and grew and don't have to worry about party support to sustain their members in their election, uh, re-election uh, efforts. And so uh, ideological caucuses, which tend to make problems for uh, the party caucus, they tend to create these ideological fissures that make it very difficult, even when you have unified government, even when you have the Republicans control the House of Representatives, the Senate, and the presidency, and they had been uh, talking for 10 years about, uh, eight years, 10 years, about repealing uh, Obamacare, and they couldn't do it, even though the, technically they had all the levers of power that they needed because their party caucus was not unified enough to make it happen. They nearly were, but they weren't quite, and, and uh, that, that is one of the problems that happens when any of these other caucus groups, particularly ideological caucus groups, gain power, all right, excuse, excuse, uh, can come together and use their power to disrupt the party agenda. Um, that's actually part of what uh, used to not happen. Groups within the parties, they wouldn't attempt to disrupt the party agenda. They would attempt to tweak its direction. Um, if, uh, in the old days, uh, hardcore conservatives within the Republican Party would try to steer the Republican agenda in a more conservative direction. Tea Partiers uh, and the Freedom Caucus, they were just happy to outright derail the Republican agenda. And again, the reason why you would derail instead of steer is because you're that kind of elected official who went to Washington, D.C. to mess things up, not to play ball with the establishment. The reason why those kinds of people are increasingly being elected is because they have sources of support, particularly monetary support, but also social media uh, and uh, uh, mainstream media support that allows people to rise into Congress without having to go through this, the traditional channels of becoming a party insider. Um, so that's what caucuses do. Caucuses are uh, blocks of votes that uh, people come, the, the group, those, block, those votes, those individual votes come together to try to leverage their collective power as effectively as possible. Now, another group distinct from this is a different category of groups, is committees, and I've put up here on the board committees, two different things committees do, and this is really just a reflection and a review about uh, on what I said in the previous lecture, which is that uh, committees sometimes take the part and reassemble bills. Uh, and in the traditional legislative process that really all roads ran through the committees and committees had a tremendous amount of not only power, but of working influence. Um, the shape of bills as they were passed finally at the end of the train or at the end of the process were largely determined within the committee. Um, and so committee chairs had a tremendous amount of power under the traditional model and committee members had uh, not as much power as the, as the chair, but a lot more power to shape policy in particular areas than rank and file members who were outside of that particular committee. Um, committees have, as I indicated last time, become more and more pass-throughs for uh, policy, the policy agenda of the party leadership, which I will talk about in a minute. And I, I think I discussed this sufficiently in the previous lecture, but um, they are often now called on to assemble bills that reflect the deals the, of leadership. Now, I should note that those leadership deals sometimes are deals that are made among caucus leaders and party leaders. Sometimes they're deals that are just made among the party leaders themselves. Um, it kind of depends on what the issue is and on how much uh, the leaders of, say, the Freedom Caucus or the Progressive Caucus, how much they can make their wishes known in this deal-making process. 
Um, but committees have, they're not entirely just pass-throughs for leadership deals anymore. There is still a lot of traditional legislating that goes on, um, and it goes on in a slow way, and some bills uh, kind of are working through this traditional process. But more and more, uh, the uh, legislative process is coming to reflect leadership deals. And so committees, uh, particularly budget committees, are called on to hammer out the technical details of what is agreed to from a negotiation that the committee chair is potentially part of, right? If you're the chair of the Energy, the, the Senate Energy Committee, you're probably going to have some input in the leadership deal, though not a definitive set of input like you would have had in the 1970s as chair of the Energy Committee. You could basically shape the energy bill to the way you wanted the world to look. Okay, that's committees that can move through this quickly because I discussed it a lot in the previous lecture. Party leaders. Uh, one thing to note about party leaders is that they uh, have a more centralized form of power uh, now than ever. And this really is a result of a couple of waves of reform in the 1970s and then in the 1990s that have more or less centralized the um, legislative process, the real legislative process, the, the, the not bills being introduced and going to committee and all the work that's being done, the real one being where bills actually have a chance to get across the finish line and become an actual policy output. Um, th that process is now centered around party leaders way more than it ever was in the past. Um, and the, so the incentive to become a party leader is stronger than ever because the legislative process is really centered around that. Um, party leaders always had a role, and their role always was to help form the agenda for the party, help prioritize uh, which issues should get most attention and, and, and uh, be f as fast-tracked as possible, making sure you did what you could to, make, to try to win a majority of seats for your party. Those, uh, what I would call traditional party leadership uh, um, activities, are still a part of party, uh, party leadership's activity, but now they have the definitive role in managing or in, in negotiating deals and in, in not just setting priorities for the party's agenda, but in actually carrying through on those. So it's, it's actually become more power and also a bigger job and more ripe for failure, particularly as ideological caucus groups have come to have more and more uh, impact. They can sabotage deals that they don't like. Uh, now, wh who are the party leaders? The, there are essentially, the, there are multiple positions, um, but the three main ones are the majority or minority leader uh, of each uh, party. Um, and whether you're the majority leader or the minority leader depends on whether your party has the minority of seats. And you can go from being one to the other. Mitch McConnell went from being majority leader of the Senate to minority leader of the Senate. Uh, Nancy Pelosi went from being majority leader, uh, minority leader to being Speaker of the House. Now, in the House, there's actually the Speaker of the House and then there's a majority leader. Currently, the Democratic majority leader is Steny Hoyer, who is uh, essentially number 1B. Like, uh, Nancy Pelosi is 1A, the majority leader is 1B. Um, because there's also, be below them, a whip. So in the House of Representatives, there's one extra uh, um, leadership position for the majority party. The minority party still only has three positions. The minority leader, the minority whip, and uh, the uh, caucus chair of the minority party. Um, that is, uh, um, the, number three is where Liz Cheney currently exists, and, and you probably have been, uh, if you're following uh, the news of Congress these days, you've probably seen Liz Cheney's name and seen the term caucus chair or number three in the Republican Party more often than usual. Generally, this person does, isn't very high profile. Um, the minority majority leader is high profile. The minority or majority whip is you know, known to insiders, people who pay close attention to Congress. The caucus chair is generally not, even, not well known, doesn't make news. Of course, Liz Cheney's making news because of her stance on the January 6th insurrection and on her stance on impeaching and removing Donald Trump and on her stance on bucking uh, the uh, direction of the Republican Party to continue embracing uh, Donald Trump himself and Trumpist type policies and more likely, uh, more uh, Trump type rhetoric. So we see who the number three is now, and that's actually, in my experience of covering American politics, it's very rare. I often don't even know who the number three is, and honestly, I don't know who the number three is in the Democratic Party. I don't know who the, who the Democratic caucus chair is. Um, that's because the job of the caucus chair is a really kind of a wonky job. The caucus chair is in charge of policy development, okay? How do we, given the agenda that we have, and the majority and minority leader are primarily in charge of like a what's the party agenda, which is taking the party platform and prioritizing things and seeing what can be gotten 
through Congress uh, that is in the party's platform. So the Democratic Party has a huge platform. The Republican Party has a huge platform. They have a lot of things they want, but part of what the majority leader's job is to do is to say, okay, well, what can we get done? And what is most important for us to get done? Now, one reason to rise to this level is that there are choices and trade-offs made. The more energy that you put into a Voting Rights Act, the less energy you can put into environmental policy. The more energy you put into immigration, the less energy you can put into uh, um, taxation or infrastructure spending. Not to say you can't do multiple things at once, but it's hard to do lots of things at once. And so one of the reasons to become the uh, party leader, particularly the majority leader, is that you're the person who has one vote, just like everyone else, in the chamber, but you have a definitive stamp on what moves forward most quickly. Uh, now, of course, if you're in the majority party and the president is from your party, the president and the, pre and the administration are gonna have a big stamp on that as well. So you're gonna be collaborating in that. Um, and if you're the minority leader, your agenda basically is to play defense for as long as you possibly can to, to, and as effectively as possible to try to get your party back into the majority. So that's the difference between what the majority and the minority party leaders are doing. The WIP is about member management, and, it, and it's really one of the few terms in politics that actually sounds like what it is. The WIP is really cracking the whip on members to stay unified behind the party's agenda. Now, in certain circumstances, that's really easy, and in other circumstances, it's very difficult. Um, one of the things the WIP is in charge of doing is the WIP count, which is to determine how many votes does the party have for a particular bill. And I mentioned the whip count sort of quickly in passing last time. Um, one of the things that, that the Speaker of the House is not gonna wanna do ever is bring a bill before the chamber for a yes or no vote um, without a pretty solid whip count that shows that that bill is going to pass. Um, it's the job of the whip to, one, take the count, and two, handle any shortfalls or any marginal cases, right? You need 218 votes in the House of Representatives to pass a bill. If you've got 225 Democrats, you can give up seven votes. You don't want to give up seven because you don't want it to be right there at 218. It's a little nerve-wracking. Let's say your whip count tells you you have 220 votes. Well, those other five people, you're going to go to work on them to try to get yes votes out of them. Let's say you only have 210 solid yes votes. Your job as the whip is to whip up eight more votes. Uh, whipping the vote means getting from a shortfall of a majority to uh, at least the majority uh, um, votes, if not more. It's always nice to have more than the bare necessity. That's the job of the whip, member management. In traditional uh, politics, one of the things that, one of the tools the whip had was party support for your reelection effort. Party uh, funds for your uh, campaign uh, um, treasury, uh, party support for your campaign rallies. Would the speaker come and speak at, at, in your district? Could you potentially get the president to come speak in your district? Other high profile members of your party, uh, celebrities, people who will help your reelection campaign. The whip controlled more or less uh, those resources and use those resources in a carrot and stick kind of way to try to maintain party discipline and party unity. One of the ways that unity of the party caucus was sought was through the, uh, the actions and attention of the whip, utilizing party resources to make sure that most of the members of the party were doing what the party leadership wanted them to do, were essentially being uh, having party discipline. Um, the caucus chair, as I say, really is kind of the policy wonk. They do policy development. They're the ones who are working hard to actually turn the ideas that the party platform has into real legislative language, into real pieces, into the Legos that will snap together to form a bill. Um, and uh, the caucus chair is doing this by consulting with members of the, of the party's caucus, right? By working with them, by hearing their ideas, by uh, get generating or uh, uh, getting their expertise as well as their connections in among the stakeholders who need to be supportive behind any bill that's actually gonna have any realistic uh, hope of, of passing. Because if you're putting together a bill where the stakeholders out in the world are gonna hate it, right? If you're putting together a healthcare bill that the pharmaceutical industry hates, then they're going to armor up and they're going to they're, they're, they're just uh, come straight at you. So ideally, if you want a healthcare bill 
you want to be able to have at least minimal acquiescence of all of the stakeholders, if not outright support, right? Um, one of the ways that the Affordable Care Act actually ended up with the individual mandate was that that was something that health insurance companies liked because they were now going to be guaranteed an expansion of customers. They didn't like the regulations they were going to have to face. They didn't like the fact that they weren't going to be able to turn people down for pre-existing uh, conditions and that they had to provide mammograms and, and, and child dental care, all that stuff. They didn't like that, but they were willing to do that, they, to, to not make a huge stink because the individual mandate was going to give them a bunch of, uh, of uh, customers. That's partly, and that, was, that, that particular feature was done within the Obama administration as well as within the Democratic caucus. Uh, it's the, the leadership to try to find policy uh, specifics that will uh, either please or at least not displease the relevant stakeholders that have the power to derail uh, the legislative process at any one of the choke points uh, that uh, that happen in, in the normal legislative process. That's the policy chair's idea. Now, one of the reasons why Republicans don't want Liz Cheney in that position is because. There's, while it's kind of a quiet, soft power compared to what the leadership does, and compared certainly to what a president uh, from your party does, um, that, form, that quiet form of soft power really has a lot of uh, um, uh, effect. As the saying goes, the devil is in the details. Well, this is where the details are getting worked out. And so uh, the ability to influence Republican policy language is held in this particular position, and part of uh, what uh, you know Republicans want to get Liz Cheney out of that job because it's basically it's just they're saying it's you know for somebody who's not lockstep with us on these other things, you don't deserve this much power. The fact that she kept it shows that she's effective, shows that she has experience, shows that she has enough connections with other party members. Now the final question to to address in this uh, lecture is how do you get to be a party leader? Uh, party leaders are chosen by the party caucus in the same way that any other leaders are chosen by an internal democratic vote, right? They vote on people. The reason why uh, um, Steny Hoyer and Nancy Pelosi are the Speaker of the House, the majority leader, is because the vast majority of Democrats wanted them to be there. The reason why Liz Cheney is the caucus chair of the Republican Party is because she got more than 50% of the votes of Republicans in the House of Representatives. Now, that just pushes the question off to more like, okay, well, how do you win those elections? What gets you to be popular among your party caucus within the chamber of Congress that you exist? Um, traditionally, and this is, I, I shouldn't say traditionally because it makes it seem like things have changed. Typically, the way that you get a party leadership position is by helping other members of your party uh, do what they want to do and to do it more easily, especially to help them do the things that are obnoxious to do those more easily. One of the most obnoxious things that an elected official has to do is raise money. You rise to party leadership by helping people raise money more easily. Some of the um, party leaders that we've seen in the last couple of decades, John Boehner and Nancy Pelosi are, are really kind of the two hallmark ones, are, have been like fundraising machines. They are, they are so good at raising money for their members that their members are thankful to them in return. The other biggest important thing that, that people do to, to gain popularity within their party is take steps to help party members get elected, right? Fundraising is, of course, essential to that, um, but uh, there are other activities. If you can connect up members of Congress with important endorsers, with important stakeholders uh, in the community, if you can uh, you know, have media appearances that will help their, their profile back in their district or in their state if it's in the Senate, then they're going to be grateful to you. Um, and if you enter Congress as a freshman with leadership ambitions, you quickly learn that the route to leadership is not being right, not having a strong ideology, not having a high media profile. The route to leadership is getting, uh, uh, is essentially becoming popular with your membership by helping other members do the things that they want to do, which is raise money, get elected, have a positive profile, have an impact on policy, right? So party, people who become party leaders, and there are a number of mechanisms through which you can do this. Leadership packs are one of them. You raise a bunch of money for your leadership pack, and then you donate that money uh, out to uh, members' re-election campaign. That's one of the ways. There are a variety of committees that actually within Congress that, uh, fundraising committees that help people rise to leadership positions. Um, the, uh, the, the, you become popular because you become a make or break person and you do a lot of making of people's lives easier. That's how you get there. Um, 
are you a good enough strategist to get the party's priorities across the finish line often enough? This is one of the reasons why Mitch McConnell is so popular. He helps with fundraising, but his real, real strength is that he helps Republicans either block legislation they don't like or get legislation passed and get appointments, judicial and executive appointments, that they like. He's a really good strategist, and that makes his caucus members happy. They're like, Mitch, you just, you're, you're helping us do our job. It's really hard to get laws passed. You're making it easier for us. We love you. We're going to vote for you. Um, that's, those are the ways, those are the, the underlying factors that help somebody rise to party leadership. Um, okay, I think that pretty much sums it up. Uh, in the next lecture, we're going to look at the outside influences that attempt to go to work on party leaders, committee chairs, caucus leaders, rank and file members, uh, and see what kind of impact uh, those people have and what factors determine their success and failure.